Money, 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 money. Can you use any money today? Money, 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 money. Uncle Sam puts it right on the line. And if that fellow with whiskers ever should decline, you can have money. Olivia Mellon. I want to tell you how I started doing this unusual work called Buddy Psychology and how financial planners got on board. Um, until 1982, I had what might be called a normal psychotherapy practice, whatever that is, specializing in women's issues and in couples' issues. I really love working with couples and doing a little business therapy on the side. Uh, and then in 1982, a friend came to me and said, we should really do workshops on money. Because, you know, he said, money is the last taboo. So I did the first Money Harmony workshop in 1982. And the next year, uh, uh, an old, uh, old friend of mine now, John Kamak, a financial planner, took my workshop, Money Harmony Seminar, and he got extremely excited and said, financial planners should hear about this. So he opened the whole door to financial planners for me in about 1983. Since then, money psychology has taken over half of my practice and half of my life. I never imagined when I started this that I would be doing all this work about money. Most people believe if I only had a little more money, everything would be fine. I don't agree with that. Unless you have money harmony, unless you have a balanced relationship to money, having a little more money won't solve the problem. In fact, it may create more problems. For example, if you're an overspender and you have more money, you have more money to overspend wildly with. If you are a compulsive saver, I call them hoarders, you will save money more compulsively if you have more money to save. If you're an avoider who avoids dealing with money, you'll have more money to avoid dealing with and you'll feel anxious about that. If you're a worrier who worries chronically about money and you come into more money, you'll have more money to worry about. And if you're what I call a money monk who thinks that money is dirty and it'll corrupt you and you come in, into more money, that will not be a blessing at all. So unless you have a balanced view of money and balanced attitudes and actions, more money will not solve the problem. Identify clients' money personality type. Helps you work with them well. Understand how this affects their psychology of investing. Uh, identify your own money type. Why? To help gauge your own strengths, weaknesses, blind spots, preferences. See, some people work best with people just like them. And some people work best with people who are not just like them. It depends on whether you work through attachment or detachment, what your personality is like. Also, I know that a lot of planners tend to be amassers and hoarders. So if you're hoarders, then you might want to use hoarder language with everybody. I had a financial planner woman friend who's a hoarder. She said she talked to spenders and their eyes would glaze over. She would say budget. She would say delaying gratification. She would say quality of life. She would say retirement needs and they would just not hear her. Now she knows how to use spender language, even though she's a hoarder. That's very important. And hoarders have to understand that spenders feel this anguish at not spending. You have to understand that. Now, there are two more groups of money types that have to do with couple relationships. One is risk takers and risk avoiders. Risk takers are usually men, risk avoiders usually women. And that has to do with investments, and uh, investing styles. And money mergers, usually men who want to put the money together in a relationship. And money separatists, usually women who want some or all separate money. So first, let's talk about where money anxieties come from. Well, when I give my public workshops, I always say, you know, in the families we grew up in, almost none of us uh, talked about money. But then somebody will always raise their hand and said, say to me, oh, that's not true. In my family, we talked about money all the time. And I'll say, really? How? Well, my father yelled at my mother for spending too much, and he worried about not having enough. I say, that is not what I mean when I say nobody talked about money. People do not have rational discussions with their children about what money is and what it isn't. They don't talk about how our society brainwashes us to live in the instant gratification mode now, how we are in a trance state creating needs and wants for objects we didn't know we wanted before we saw all those ads. We, we basically do not talk about money in a way to teach our children sane attitudes. We also don't talk about our own blind spots to help them avoid them. Out of all these irrational influences from childhood, we develop what I call money myths. And these are magical, mystical beliefs of all, about all the wonderful things that money can do. Now, I, I don't want to argue about each money myth because each money myth is partly true, and I understand that. So we just as assume that that's a given. But if you believe in any of these myths too globally, then you do not make rational decisions with your money. It's like it, it, it makes the subject of money emotionally loaded for you. The first one is money equals happiness. Now, most of us believe that to some extent, right? If I only had a little more money, 
I'd be happy. How many people believe that, sort of? Would you raise your hand? Yeah, most of the group. I do, too, of course. And so if you want to demystify that one, I would urge you to write down the one, two, or three things you can think of that you love to do that make you the happiest. How much it costs to do them and whether they're best done alone or with another person. I want to tell you that I've done this with thousands of people in workshops, and almost everybody has things on the list that are free. Did anybody have things on the list that are free? How about less than $50? At least one thing on the list, less than $50? Yeah. Well, and usually best done with another person, or at least some of them are. Yeah. So I think it's very important to understand that money really isn't happiness. Um, money equals security, I guess, is one of my favorites. I know there are some financial planners in this audience. We all love that one, especially security in old age. Who, doesn't, who believes that money equals security in old age? Everybody believes that somewhat, right? So if you believe that money equals security, especially security in old age, this is my favorite one to debunk, I would like you to think about the elderly people you know and what constitutes true security. Uh, I knew an elderly woman who had a lot of money, but she was a hermit, and with all her money she could not find anybody to take her to the grocery store to clean her apartment, and if she had died of a heart attack it would have been three weeks before anyone found her in her apartment. With all her money she was not secure. The most important factor for security in old age is to be surrounded by people of all ages, a natural network of goods and services that are exchanged from just being in contact with a lot of other people. Now, that's, it's not true that one doesn't have to save enough for old age. But if you are too gripped by panic that the only thing that will be security in old age is saving enough, first of all, you might not save in the smartest way. And second, you'll be so emotionally charged that you won't have the time to cultivate relationships and things that are equally, if not more, important. Work with clients' resistance to take action. That's an Aikido technique. I'm going to show you what this looks like. If a punch comes to you in Aikido, you don't meet it with a brick wall or you get hit. If a punch comes to you, you dance with it and you take it off in the direction you want it to go. And that's what I mean by work with clients' resistance. You begin by joining with the resistance. Any questions about this? Are there actual differences between men and women when it comes to money? Yes, there are differences, although there are many ways that men and women are similar about money. Since we've talked about the money personality types, which are generally uh, not gender-based, except for risk taker and risk avoider and money merger and money separatist. Let's now talk about some of the differences. Women are raised in a world that is more accommodating and uh, cooperative. Deborah Tannen has talked about this wonderfully. And men are raised in a world that is much more competitive and hierarchical. So they see the world very differently. And this will create tremendous differences when it comes to money. One of the biggest differences is that men are generally raised to believe that they will be competent to deal with money, even though nobody tells them how to do it. It's sort of like sex. You're supposed to figure it out. You know, you're supposed to be good at it, but nobody tells you. And women are raised to believe they won't be good at it. If they're lucky, some man is going to take care of it for them. Also, men and women have different burdens around money and work. Men feel a tremendous burden to be the provider. Even if the woman works, the man feels the burden of provider. Women, on the other hand, have the burden of the second shift, you know, super women working, mother, home, wife, everything. Some females have a lot of male traits and some males have a lot of female traits. You almost have to approach them as the opposite sex. I have a couple like that in therapy, not just about money, but about everything. And he is definitely in the female stereotype role. He's always wanting contact. He wants to talk about feelings. He wants mushiness. He wants affection. She wants space, you know? And that's just how they are about almost everything. So we know that about them. And I do approach them opposite. Yeah. I just got two therapists, married couple, as clients. Oh, poor you. Uh -huh. and, and the wife is calling me all the time in the last oh. week. I mean, they're just brand new, and, and I try to give her the time and the patience, and it must be terrible. And, oh. I'm afraid they're going to drive me crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Refer them to a therapist. <laughs> Definitely. That's a perfect answer to your question, no doubt about it. And set clear limits. Yeah. You know, charge her for, her, for the time. Tell her that you, you know, you're not comfortable. I mean, cl cl clients do all sorts of things. You know, couples are, first of all, always trying to get you aside and telling you how crazy the other one is, you know? I have that all the time. You know, I go walk out of a couples therapy session and the man takes me aside and says, you know she's on drugs for depression, don't you? I mean, you know, it's terrible, you know? And everybody does this kind of thing. I mean, everybody wants the other person to change. I mean, it's just human nature. So the most important thing to remember about money is that money is not love, power, security, control, and on and on. 
It's just dollars and cents, a tool to accomplish some of life's goals. If you can remember that and if you can unload it, then you can really use it as a way to enhance intimacy instead of as a block to intimacy, as well as a tool to accomplish some of your own individual goals. Money isn't everything. I like to buy sports cards and you know, foot, sign footballs and things like that. I try to hide them in the house for a little while until she gets, until she yeah. gets the, the bill for it. Find the bill there. Yeah, he bought a, a football helmet for 200 bucks. Well, when I pulled the car into the driveway, Oh my God, what is she doing? Where'd you? She went crazy. Uh, if I come home with something new, how much did you pay for that? Was it on sale? And uh, sometimes I tell them it was when it wasn't. <laughs> Olivia Mellon took them shopping and told them, act like the other person. And we'll talk. Really, I really want to buy this. But what other Tell, tell her, not it? today. We want to think about it first. I mean, it's, it, you like it? Let's but... think about it. I mean, let's, let's hold off. It's on sale. It's only $550. So let's hold off. If it's on sale today, it's going to be on sale again. Oh. The idea behind this is that each will better understand their own money personality by seeing it in their partner and by playing their partner's role, better understand how their partner feels. Olivia Mellon actually had some interesting points. Are you an overspender or an underspender? Be honest here. Al? I think I spend right about where I should be. You're perfect, in other words. No, not perfect, <laughs> but I think I, when you average it out, yeah. I think I'm pretty good. I've had this uh, strict Catholic upbringing, and so I tend to deprive myself, and I tend to not buy, but lately I'm breaking out of the mold. Good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I hate to spend more time with you. So I, yeah, I'll let you help me out with that. You spend what my about money. You? I am an overspender. Are you? Yep. No question. Now, do you agree with Olivia that most overspenders are married to underspenders? Not in my case. No, <laughs> no, no, no. no that would be the one that breaks that mold. Does Lynette get the co-op? No, no, no. Thank goodness. I was talking about my other, my previous wife. <laughs> when we, windows, yes. windows are there to seduce you. Yeah, when we see with our kids this, this TV ads, we should say that we should make fun of it with our kids. We should say, see this? They're, they're, they're sucking us in. Money, 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 money.